Well, it's a pleasure to be here, I think, for the third time. Or is it the fourth time? Uh, third time. Fourth. Thank you. Um, yeah, right, exactly. This is the fourth winner. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, be with the graduates of the Cannell School of Nursing. I have been working with the Cannell School uh, since Dean Gennaro came on and insisted you have another New York City outer borough person <laughs> as a consultant. And so I'm from Brooklyn, she's from Staten Island, so you can see I'm classier than she is. <laughs> but we adored the girls from Staten Island when I was a teenager. But the bridge wasn't there yet, so it was hard to get across. The, uh, we're going to begin, and I, I, I actually talked to Mairead on the, on the phone for about 20, 25 minutes last week, and on the basis of that, I'm here to give her my resume and say <laughs> that I will come work for her anytime she likes. Uh, and we will talk about, because she is clearly a person who knows what leadership is, and what, much more importantly, knows how to be comfortable as a leader, which is the, probably the hardest part of leadership, is, uh, is making sure your leadership, your leadership represents you uh, as, just in, in, in an integral way. But when you first came out of here, I, you know, nobody has said anything about the nature of her job. And just to give you an extent of what she controls, if you will, at uh, Bregman Women's, it's 900 beds, a million ambulatory visits a year, 12,000 employees. Boston College, by contrast, Father Lay isn't here. So I'll say Boston College, by contrast, has only about 4,000 employees and a $2 billion operating budget, again, dwarfing that of this institution, a lot of responsibility. But I want to return or begin with your first job out of the School of Nursing, which is like a lot of first jobs in nursing. You worked in critical care. And can you describe what that was like and what, if anything, you have taken away from that as regards nursing, what did you learn about what good uh, about leadership? What good leadership was about as you went in there as a person who wasn't a leader at all? Was at the bottom of the totem pole. You know, I think um, when I was a new grad, we hadn't Pat Benner's work on from novice to expert really hadn't hadn't hit the the airwaves yet. So, you know, as a new grad, we expected that we had to perform and had to perform pretty well and. Um, I wish I could say that I always felt great when I was, when I was driving home after, after work. So I think as a new grad back then, I, I have taken that experience of being a new grad with me since those days. I, um, would f I think that I felt a tremendous amount of responsibility and often didn't necessarily when I would struggle or question things, I wasn't able to talk about it with someone because he didn't talk about, we didn't really talk about those things. We now know, as we think about novices in any role, especially practice professions, that what you're experiencing and what your head is telling you and your mind is doing is not just you. It's probably happening to every new nurse, for example. And we realize that through narratives and through conversations, we can learn an awful lot. We know as, you know, as you think about new graduates can tend to be very task oriented. You know, I've got to do this and I have to do this and I have to do this. And as you look at nurses who are more, uh, more expert, you realize that there's just beautiful choreography um, connecting the tasks with the relationship with the, with the patient. So in, um, in my role as, as both a Professor at Yale, and also as a chief nurse and a leader, I'm very interested in making sure, we used to say something um, at the Brigham, and I think it's permeated pretty well, no nurse should ever feel unsupported, whether it's 3 a.m. or whether it's 10 a.m. in the morning. They should always, there should always be a phone call that they can, uh, that they can make, um, because that, what they're experiencing, None of us should be on our own when it comes to, when it comes to our practice and, and our care. So the, the notion of, um, as, a, as a leader, realizing, and for any of us, realizing that 
we're all learning every day and we don't do it by ourselves. We need to engage with other people and in hospital settings we now, what I realize is so important, we need to engage and partner with other disciplines. We'll, so we'll, we, try to, we try to create those opportunities. We'll come back to that. You, you mentioned Yale and you took, was it 10 years? Oh, ten, from, yeah, yep. from practicing, yep. as it were, or clinical work. Well, I was a joint. I was a well, clinical specialist. Oh, you were a clinical specialist there, but you got your PhD there. No, I got my PhD at UConn. Uh, uh, I need to read, read my notes. Sketch. I did. <laughs> you doctorated you were doing so UConn. Well. I'm sorry. You were doing so well. You're right. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, this is leadership in action. So, folks. how are you, Ben? I have, just, I have just been led to the right university, UConn. <laughs> Where you got your PhD, and I take it you had an opportunity to stay on yeah. at UConn as part of the faculty, yeah. and you made the determination, I'm sure there's a school of nursing faculty in the room here, you made the determination to leave that rather comfortable kind of work and throw yourself right back into the middle of it. Mm -hmm. Why did you do that? I needed, for me, I felt that um, though I practiced as a part-time clinical specialist, I'm looking at Terry because she, you'll be hearing, you'll be seeing Terry Fulmer in a, in a, in a few minutes as well. We were both at Yale at the, at the, at the same time. Um, I felt like I needed to get really back into, for me, what I would call um, pra practice. So I had an opportunity to come back to Brigham and Women's Hospital as the Director of Nursing Research. Um, what I, and that opportunity was going to allow me to work with clinical nurses and work with them as they had questions in their practice to try to look at the science uh, and the literature um, behind their questions and see if we could uh, help them to have more active inquiry uh, and more evidence-based practice. And then from there, I just had different you positions. You had a series of other positions of leadership there. And the, the big change for you came when you became uh, the uh, chief nursing officer and senior VP at the Brigham. Correct. And that must have been an extraordinary leap for you. You were running small organizations. What was it like to transit, as it were, from being a middle manager to being a very senior manager? It was... Um I think in any of our, in, whenever we transition from one role to another, I think there's, there's that period of time, whether I'm a new grad as a novice or I'm a chief nurse as a novice. Um, easy to say in retrospect, but, yes, right. um, <laughs> but um, what it, it was, I found myself feeling lots of, having lots of different reactions. One was this was like the most amazing job I could ever have. My mother was a chief nurse. And I remember um, growing up, um, almost experiencing her role with her. She, you know, she'd be making gravy on Thanksgiving, you know, Thanksgiving for Thanksgiving dinner, and the phone. We always had a long in the kitchen, a long telephone cord. She'd be <laughs> at the stove making the gravy, talking about, you know, with someone at the hospital about something that was that was going on. And what I was impressed with, and I think what was very interesting, is how she began to live that role as well as being as well as being a mother. And I think when as I have different leadership positions, what I realized is so important, and I realized as chief nurse, was that how important it was to have real passion in your work and passion as a leader. Because you're gonna work real hard, many hours, and it's gotta be worth it for you. And so when I had the opportunity to be the chief nurse at Brigham and Women's Hospital, it was a dream come true. It was to work with nurses um, who were among, I would say, the best in the world, um, who knew so much about uh, what they needed to do for their patients. But we had an amazing opportunity to work to, I had an amazing opportunity to work with them to create a department for very much what I would call professional nursing practice. Um, and um, Susan, you referred to, to our book. The book that's outside here is a book that 85 nurses from Brigham and Women's Hospital wrote. And it's a story of our five-year journey together um, and where we, where we started and with a vision um, that, that 
we created together. And the vision is very simple. It's to provide excellent care to patients and families with the very best staff and in the safest environment. And it was what really drove our work. And so everything we did um, in those five years, and, it, and things that are continuing today with Dr. Dr. Jackie Somerville, who's a um, double eagle, by the way. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm only a single eagle. Um, really continue, continues, um, continues to, this, to, this, to this day. Um, but it was to be able to work with our nurses and create something with them so that they could provide the very best care to patients. So what would be more thrilling? I, I understand that, but you know, it seems to me, and maybe you were alluding to this when you said there were some days when you went home and it wasn't so great, to move from being one of many mid-level leaders to the person in charge. Um, is nursing a singular profession where, where you're, the people you work with, your colleagues, are simply accepting and, and, you know, that there's no jealousy and there's no, you know, it strikes me that to make that kind of move requires some, uh, would require some very smooth moves on your own in terms of how you project your leadership, how you use it, how you use your new power. Is that, uh, am I correct? Is there a learning curve on that? Was there for you? There's, there's, it, it, there's, there, is, there is a learning curve. It, you know, it, it was interesting. I moved to my position having been in that institution. I don't know if that made it easier or more, more difficult because, you know, it's why, you know, why did she move yes, to that position? Yes, precisely. Um, but on the same, on the same token, um, one of the things that, is, that works for me is building relationships. And so I did, do feel like I had been there long enough and had, had enough credibility with, with um, different disciplines that it made it um, a little bit easier. The other thing I, I think that is important as, for new leaders, especially for me in this, in this position, the first is, as I said, to really have this sense of passion. that you, It was exciting for me to be in this job. The second is that you really have to pick good talent to be around you. And I don't want to be cold and callous about that, but it is so important that you have your team with you, um, a team that will tell you the truth, a team that will allow you to, um, to push the envelope and allow you to push them a little bit. Um, but that is, that's probably the, one of the most important lessons um, for me, anyway, in that position, because it was that team that, with that, that team, the chemistry from that team with the nursing department, I think, really was what, what made, it, um, let me, made it grow. Then, let's, let me pursue the truth question. What tends to happen to people who get promoted is that people stop telling them the truth because yeah. you have all this power. They tell you things they think you want to know. I tell you a secret. I've seen this at Boston College. I know. <laughs> Hard to imagine a place as honest with the amount of integrity we have, but I've seen people tell our presidents things they just simply thought the presidents yeah. wanted to know that were not true. What, what, how do you filter that, and how do you find out what's really going on? I understand how important the trusted lieutenants are, but once you get past that, I mean, you're talking about 10, more than 10,000 people. You know, how do you find out? You, um, there are certain people that you know will tell you the truth. <laughs> and, you know, it's not always a good day. <laughs> <laughs> When, when, you, when you hear that, and you don't really want to hear it. And, you know, I, 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 there are many times when I'm told the truth and I just get so ticked that I try to cut it, cut it off, and the next, day, the next day I'm kind of you going to that office to and knocking on the door and saying, okay, now, really, when you said that, what did you? Um, so there are, some, there are some people. You have to be, we all have to be willing to listen, right, because it's, it's, not, always, it's not always a good day when, when, when we do listen. Um, so you get to know who's, who's going who's gonna to help you with, with, with certain, with, with certain sure. things. The other thing, um, the other thing I find is that a, a method that I used a lot as chief nurse and I continue to use today is fo having focus groups. And, you know, I've, there are some, um, some of my colleagues, some of my cl the clinical nurses at the Brigham are here today. I don't think, I don't think our clinical nurses ever have trouble 
And I don't think our, my non-nurses, other employees now, have trouble tell, telling you the truth. It's your people around you who won't tell you the truth. But if you are present enough and poke your nose into enough, uh, enough different groups, you'll, you'll hear from people. People who are so far removed, they don't, they don't have to, they don't feel the same sense of concern. Right. Did you innovate the, uh, uh, the groups, the, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, what, what you say they were, the groups you brought together? The focus groups? The fo was that your innovation there? Or ha was that part of the practice at the Brigham? It hadn't been the practice. Okay. Um, it was something that, we, that we, we started. It was very important for, um, uh, there, were, there were two reasons for doing it. One was I needed to know, and even today in my role, I need to know from people on the front lines what, what's going on. And the other thing that I am committed to and I think is really important and tried to do um, in the Department of Nursing was to make sure that nurses, nurses felt that their voice was heard, that it was heard for, by me, and that it would be heard in, in other forums. You know, that video we showed here, and one of the, I mean, there was nothing fake in it, let's put it that way. We followed you around, you were at a, you had a very, I believe, I don't know if I'd call it a tough encounter, but it was described to me a frank encounter with that group of nurses at the nursing station there. And, and one of our sound guys was saying, we can't let this be heard, what these people are saying. <laughs> and, uh, and he said to me, you know, I said, well, I don't understand what they're saying. So as much as we heard, we heard. But, but you know, it was, a, an aston according to my staff, astonishingly frank discussion. They told you everything they thought they revealed all the secrets. It strikes me. It's kind of, either you'd set that up before we walked in. No. Uh, it's, uh, does that happen a lot, where people are that open? The, 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 the problem there was they were concerned about some issues on the floor. And they just let you know, right down to the last detail, what those issues were. And uh, does that happen a lot? Or? So we are trying um, at the Brigham, and I think in most institutions now, um, we realize that we need to be much more transparent about what's not working well. We can't, the idea of, same thing, only in a, from a system perspective. Right. Oh, everything's just fine. No, everything right. isn't fine. And we realize, as we think about the, word, the words, or the concept that we hear a lot about now is creating a culture of safety. And that is to make sure, and you know, some of us in this room, you can think about, I have times when I, used to work nights as, uh, as a young nurse and there'd be a patient problem at 3 a.m. and I would worry about whether I call the physician or not and wake him up and should I. And the, meanwhile, the patient is, um, is, in need, is in need of something. What was it in our culture that made that concern apparent, that made me question what I was actually going to do? We realize that happens all the time. And so what we, we started, and I was a part of the team that, that, that started this, was what we call safety rounds. And we go to floors, we go to um, patient care units, and we ask staff, what worried you when you were driving home today? What do you think, where was there a near miss? What, what really worried you? What do we need to know? And what do we need to do to make sure this is a safe environment? So we believe, as a leadership team, that it's critical for us to ask and be willing to take it. And, but then the third part of it is, so we ask, you know, we, we try to understand it, and then the third part is to try to do something about it and to show our employees that, in fact, you know what? You said this was a problem. You said the meds never come up on time. When a, when a patient gets admitted from labor and delivery up to postpartum, um, Holly, I don't know if you ever heard about this on 7, but, um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, um, how do we make this better? Because the nurses are on the front line, or employees are on a front line of something, and the patient it needs their medication, and our system doesn't get the medication up there in time. What's that all about? The previous chief, op chief operating officer at the Brigham was who? Kate, I don't... Kate Walsh. She's now president of BMC. Okay. Now, uh, was she a nurse as well? No. What was she? Um, she was an administrator. Okay. Are you the first nurse to have risen to this? Position? At the, at the Brigham? At the Brigham, I mean, and in the Harvard, at the Harvard system right now, yeah. I would say. Let me ask you that. I mean, the, uh, you were talking about being a young nurse, 3 o'clock in the morning, worried about waking a doctor who may have been younger than you were, but that doesn't matter. 
The, the, um, and when we talked on the phone, you, we were talking about your leadership style, which we'll get into in a second. And you were talking about the different leadership style that, that doctors have, men and women, but just a different way of making decisions and so on. What, what were the obstacles to you culturally in rising in this way in a major teaching hospital where, you know, all the doctors are famous, as it were. Everybody's, uh, you know, people come from all over the world and uh, from all over, you know, I've had my own experience of chronic illness. I know I was sitting next to people who literally come from across the country to get the same treatment I was getting two miles from my house. Mm -hmm. So what, what was it like to um, make your way through this and as, as a nurse and not as an administrator? That is to say, the relationship between doctors and nurses doesn't need to be explained in this room. It's complex, it's changed, evolved tremendously over the years, but still you must have felt that, perceived that. How did you deal with it? The, the uh, well, you know, the, the kind of entitlement, I think, that many doctors feel in terms of their command of a scene mm -hmm. and, and your responsibility, which was wider than theirs mm -hmm. to a large mm -hmm. degree. Mm -hmm. How did you deal with that, that kind of relationship, or I'd even say antagonism, antagonism probably at times? You know, this is where um, I think we need, um, I, so I, I would say from my experience, I probably grew up in a period of time when it was more prevalent right. than it is today. I think the concept of teams and partnerships are more pronounced and valued much more today than they, than they were, were in the past. Um, I think that um, Boy, I wish I had. I wish I had the the real answer. I think there <laughs> there are people that I there are colleagues that I can remember, who were, so uh, so good to work with from day one, and there were some that were you know like battle axes, you know, um, who you would really you would really want to, you know, stay away from, or um, who were just just didn't un understand the importance. You know, um, I don't know how I actually dealt with it. I think in time for me, as I became more comfortable with my own practice, so this is at the bedside, is that what you're sure. um, At the bedside, I felt like I could advocate better and that I was picking up the right cues from the patients and I did have the right information. And so it was I would advocate and not back, back off. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably how we are in many, whether it's nursing or other you know, careers as at leaders, as, you, as we become more comfortable, more confident, um, we, and we um, can make our case better. We, we continue it. But it's easy. It's, it's not the natural gravitation if you've been beat down sure. enough. But I do believe um, things have, have changed. We try to promote uh, much more. Uh, interdisciplinary and, and interprofessional collaboration. All of us in this room, I'm sure, are aware of the, uh, aware of the need for that. We need, you know, we, when Ben and I were talking, um, and some people say, well, you know, how do you make decisions? And, you know, what is, the, it, Susan said, what is that role that you're, you know, what is that role of a chief operating officer? Well, part of, part of that, the role is how do you, in healthcare, I think that leaders and I can't speak outside of healthcare, but in healthcare, you can't have one person in charge. If you're talking about a patient and if you're talking about we're doing work and we're making decisions because of what patients need, there's no one person who's responsible really for that patient. So I've found for me, and I think the reason I've been successful, maybe I wouldn't be successful in investment banking, but there, I think the reason I've been successful is that I really, um, I do best when I partner. And I do best when I can open up and ask people about their opinions. And I think that's essential in patient care. I agree. One thing we talked about on the phone, I think it's also essential. You had raised it. You said something about the Brigham culture being right for you. Mm -hmm. That you were comfortable there. You understood it. You understood the way people were supposed to relate to each other and that you fit right into that naturally. Mm -hmm. So when people come to you and they say, gee, uh, you know, I really admire you, you've, 
you know, you've got this great responsible job. I'm, you know, 10 years into my profession in nursing, whatever it might be. We're talking about leadership generally. What, what advice do you give them? And, and they want advice, clearly. I'm sure you have lots of people who, who you mentor and who would like for you to mentor. What advice do you give them about finding their way as leaders? I take it one of them would be find a place that welcomes you. Don't try and change the culture of the place to match your culture. That would probably be a first kind of guideline. Mm -hmm. What else would you tell them? What I, I, I've mentioned this a couple of times, this concept of passion, and I don't mean it you know, like you know, in a real loose way. What I, what I think is important for any of us, and, and I would say to students and I would say to um, people who are looking to advance in their careers, make sure that you engage whatever you're doing. It sounds so trite, but I think it's so true. Make sure that you really are engaged in what you're doing. Make sure some young people or some people who want to move on are always looking for the next step and the next job. And that gets noticed pretty, <laughs> pretty, you know, pretty quickly. And that's when you know, you're going to chop people off at, you know, why did you get the raise, why didn't I get right. the raise, and, and, and all that. But um, I always say to, say to people, you may have a long-term view of your journey and where you want to be, but it will play itself out. And if you do well in whatever you're doing, you will advance. The other thing that I think that, we, that, I, that I often talk to people about is it's good to have mentors. It's good to have or, or supervisors or bosses who you can talk to, who can help you understand how you are growing and how you are learning and putting the pieces together. Because sometimes you move from one job to another within your career in an illogical way, mm -hmm. um, but when you can put the pieces together, you may not have had a management position, but boy, you, you led five teams of interdisciplinary groups and you achieved X kind of outcomes. You know, maybe you, if you can talk about that and you realize that that's what you did, you may be able to convince others, and pr pr not convince, but present yourself in such a way. So when you talk about people uh, who are mentoring you, and, and who can see the pattern before you can see it. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. And then can tell you this is not as innocuous, or not, excuse me, this is not as anomalous as it may appear to you. You're right for this. It gives you the confidence. So having people you can talk to about that who will say, you know, you're ready for this. That's right. Even if you don't that, think that's so. That's right. Or, yeah, just look what you just did. Why do you think you shouldn't apply for that? Yeah. You know, so sometimes we can't, we can't, tell the picture, the story ourselves, because we're too in, in, enmeshed yeah, in it. it's hard to see. Can I mention a phrase you mentioned on the phone that I thought was interesting? I asked you how you thought of yourself as a leader, and you said you thought of yourself as a servant leader. And there's a religious kind of connotation to that I think nobody in this room will miss. But what, what, is, what do you mean by that? A servant leader as opposed to, I don't know, a, a, a dictatorial, I guess, would be one way. To, but, but a leader who's at the service of the people she's leading, in this case, not at the service of your ambitions, your career, the extra bonus at the end of the year if you make your marks. How do you view it? What's, what's the servant leader to you? What, what, that, what it means to me is that I'm only an N of one as in my role, and I can't do it. And in order to achieve what we need to achieve, it's going to be through other people. And so my responsibility is to make sure people who report to me can do their jobs. Because that's when we'll get to where we need to be. So I'm more in service to the people who, if you select the right people, if you have the right people working on your team, um, you can let them grow and let them go. And, um, and what, the questions that I would ask is, what do you need? What can I do for you? As opposed to, you should do this and that. So that tends to be my style. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, I think as we, um, I think it, it's, it's, it, seems, it seems to work. And when you are working with a highly educated group, when, as a nurse leader, when you're working with nurses, who better than them to, to show you the way? You, you know, we, 
and if I can, if we can create an environment as a chief nurse or as a chief operating officer for people to feel that they can grow, what is, what is better, right? So that's what I mean by that. You know, I, uh, you strike me as a very equable person, a person who doesn't have big highs and big lows. What happens when you get furious about some stupidity <laughs> that's been committed under your, within your area of responsibility? And I, I know Brigham and Women's is a great place, but I'm absolutely sure oh. stupidities get committed there. And now I'm looking As, out at my BWH colleagues here. <laughs> <laughs> Never, <laughs> Never happens, happens, right? <laughs> of course. Never happens. Seriously, I mean, what, how do you handle that? Not, uh, it's, it's, it seems to me the way you have, have built yourself and what's natural to you as a leader is not to flip out. That right. would be a betrayal of the kind of leader you want. What do you do? How do you handle so I, I don't flip. I usually do stay pretty flat. Yeah. Um, and when, um, when I flip out, I get very impatient. And uh, I always regret it. <laughs> and, You're not the um, only one. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I do it, I, I, I believe I do it rarely. And I always remember it. And I always go through, give myself the 10th degree on it. I'm like, wow. what. Why did you go there? Why, what was it all, you know, that's when you start to say, what is it all about you? What about this, the, the, the person? And I'm fortunate to have a great husband who probably would tell you really how I flip out, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not asking. We'll but bring I, but, you down later and get the real story. But, but, I, but I am able to control, to control pretty well. Good. Um, well, I'm going to open it up to you folks for questions, but I, I want to ask one more question, Mairead, before this part of the interview. And, and what do people want from leaders? As you stand on the floor, we just saw you addressing an audience. We saw you at the nurse's station. All these people are looking at you. You know, you're looking back at them. They're looking for something. What do people want from leaders? In I think they want to be acknowledged and acknowledged for their good work. Can you, can we tease that out a little? I mean, you know, is, is it, do people, uh, I have a sense, some of my staff is here, they can argue with me Is afterwards. he a good leader? Is he a good leader? Uh, no. We're not going there. <laughs> the, uh, this is your award, not mine. <laughs> the, uh, next year. <laughs> the, you know, uh, my sense is, is uh, you know, people want in a very uh, sort of clear way, they want to be praised. They, won't, they don't want to be chastised to embarrassment. Correct. If they do something wrong, it should be pointed out, but not in a mean-spirited way. Right. Uh, it, it, you know, when, 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 when you're looking at those folks and they're looking at you and you're the COO of the institution, they're looking for acknowledgement, you're saying, but what is, what is involved in acknowledgement? Um, I think, uh, okay, so it may sound somewhat trite. So, they want to know that they're being heard, that they're being respected, um, and, and kind of embedded in that is because you value them, you, you believe that they are important for, uh, and essential for the work that needs to be done. Um, you, you know, so that's probably the, the foundational core. Sure. Then there are people who um, require, so that's the baseline. Then there are people who require other things. There are some people who, um, I have some people on my team, for example, who I know can't wait for the next job. <laughs> and so it's like, so I'm like trying to think, okay, what can I give you for this and that? You know, so there's, that's another, sure. so that, that kind of person is looking for something, something else. But I think in general, so as, as managers or leaders, we know the people that work with us, and so we, you kind of, we should cu customize what, how, we, how we think they can grow and develop and feel good about their work. But in general, I think it's respect, it's acknowledgement of their, in, of their work, of their intent, of their, of their value to the organization. I, I know I said that would be a last question for me, but I have one more. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I hope this will be of interest to anybody, everybody here. <laughs> Did you ever decide to be a leader, or was it something someone else decided for you or something that just, it happened? My story is far from the typical story. I don't think, 
um, you know, I, um, I think it, it, I was intrigued by it. But I thought I was going to be a nurse and then a teacher. Um, and, but maybe you can say there's leadership in all of those. Sure um, there is. And, um, but I didn't say day one that I wanted to be a chief nurse or ever, ever wanted to be a chief operating officer um, or a manager. Yeah. I think, I, I, and for me that was good because it allowed me to stay open and it allowed me to um, test myself. If I, I sometimes, for me, had I said, gee, by year five I want to be a nurse manager and by year ten, and this is how some, some people think about their lives. What's your five-year plan? What's your ten-year plan? Right. Uh, you know, I would have, I probably would have lost tremendous opportunity. Sure. Well, I, th I think, actually, I think that's the way to go, the yeah. way you just yeah. described, to yeah. be open to yeah. what's available yeah. and not thinking of what's over the yeah. wall. Enjoy today. Yeah. Take advantage and do your best for today. I think that's good.